Hello, hi, my name is Jeff Kember. I'm a <clears throat> Office of the CTO Technical Director for Google, and I've had the opportunity to work at such companies as Pixar and Framestore, ILM. I've been with Google about two and a half years and really excited to be here to talk with you guys today about cloud rendering. We also have Hannes Wiglefs here, here today with us from MPC, and he'll be talking about some exciting work that they did on our cloud in the fall of last year. So the concept of batch rendering, um, batch computing, batch rendering, it's all kind of synonymous. When we talk about batch compute, rendering is one of the many use cases of it. So if anyone is here from other industries, be it finance or oil and gas or other high performance computing, the same architectures and technologies, network transfer, storage techniques and such we're gonna be talking about today can be utilized across the realm. When we look at an architecture diagram later, I'll point out some of the intricacies to the different markets as well. So Google has a unique global network, and that's something I'm really excited about, and the fact that you can onboard in Helsinki and jump off in Taiwan, or get on in Tokyo and jump off in Frankfurt, and you're on our private network under the ocean 100% of the time. As soon as you're peered with us in a pop, you're encrypted in motion and at rest. So the ability to offer that level of service is because of this backbone. The content delivery network we have as well um, is peered in um, more than 100 different locations. You can see we have additional transatlantic and Pacific links uh, being lit up in 2018. So this roadmap is obviously subject to change for timing, but this is where we are today. So when we talk about cloud scale rendering, it, it's exciting to me. Um, I get to meet with customers who um, have a whole bunch of compute on-prem and they say we want 5,000 cores or 20,000 cores. And after we finish the architectural diagrams and conversations and look at the workloads and such, it's quite common to come out with a quota that's 100,000 cores. And it's not that they are going to run that sustained, but they're in a situation where they can use preemptibles, which we'll talk about later, um, but they can use them for shorter periods of time, and they can be in a scenario where they can say, instead of running for 24 hours as they would normally, they can run for maybe four or five hours at really high compute numbers in order to get the frames back quickly. This is a list of some of the things we're going to talk about in terms of being able to put together a successful cloud rendering strategy on Google. So the first thing you need to do is to be able to connect with us. And with the 100 plus points of presence, most major cities in the planet, we have an, a fiber line into the exchange there or multiple exchanges in each of those cities. The opportunity to connect with us in a variety of different ways, and we have a new announcement at the show that occurred in a keynote earlier this week, we can talk about our connection options. So we have a direct peering option, we have carrier interconnect, uh, and then of course we have a managed VPN offering. And the opportunity to connect with us directly over the internet um, to uh, initial proof of concepts and to be able to put um, smaller files up onto the cloud and such, that's super successful. We also have customers who have multi-10 or 40 gig bonded lines into us. So there's a variety of scaling opportunities. This Google Cloud Interconnect slide, this was announced this week. And so pretty excited about the fact that we have a private connection into our switch um, at a colo facility. And if you end up through a third party, um, this is what that diagram looks like in terms of being able to have a service provider providing the feed for you and then a connection to you. So the opportunity to connect directly with us is available and uh, we're keen for customers to be able to have that functionality. Um, one thing I encourage pe people to do if they're, if they're on the nerdy side as I am, um, Jupiter Fabric. So we name our different network fabrics after celestial objects, it's true. So uh, Jupiter is the name of the network fabric um, that, that uh, this is like a, basically a 2012 um, circa research paper. Now, there's a blog post that's really accessible and then there's this multi-page paper. This image comes from the blog post and is also in the paper itself. Um, what I think is really cool about it is there's some top researchers that uh, diagram and explain how the software-defined networking works at Google. There's pictures of the data of racks within the data center. There's diagrams explaining how interconnects work, how top of rack switches work. You know, the fact that as opposed to having maybe 10 gig E connections, we, you, you may have on prem, um, we're running 40 gig interconnects um, between our various hosts and such. So the opportunity to have control over the complete software stack as well as the hardware side enables us to have really flexible quality of service and be able to run at really high rates. And that difference in network is a huge differentiator for us. And I encourage anyone to Google that, the paper will just pop up. Jupiter Fabric is a great keyword. 
So in terms of how do you store the data for render jobs, um, yeah, there's all sorts of different offerings at Google. Um, it's all object and block um, for us. And so we'll just dig into that a little bit more. On the object side, we have Google Cloud Storage. And I'll talk about the different tiers of that and the availability of them and how they work and durability and such. But on the block side, that's really um, more analogous to what you're used to dealing with on-prem. So, you know, everybody is using an NFS POSIX compliant file system on-prem. That's just what the tools need. And in that context, we offer persistent disk, um, both HDD for hard drive variant, which is our standard persistent disk, and we also offer SSD persistent disk. Now, these PD offerings are both network attached storage, um, and they are incredibly fast. Um, we ha What's cool about them is they can scale as well, so expect these numbers to go up over time. The other cool thing that I love is local SSD, and we'll go into some use cases later, but that is super high speed attached to the VM physically. Um, it's 700,000 IOPS, basically the speed of DDR RAM, uh, DDR2, uh, in, 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 in terms of um, use capabilities. And it's less expensive than buying RAM in the machine. So you may want to have um, an option to control the size of your VM and augment it with local SSD. We can talk about those strategies in a bit. In terms of the block store for Google Cloud Storage, multi-regional, uh, fantastic offering in the fact that it lets you store data in two locations that are more than 150 miles apart. So if you're serving content, you want to have disaster recovery, you want to guarantee that you have the data in multiple locations that are physically far apart and disparate, then multi-regional is your friend. For most VFX workloads for storing the data, we recommend regional. That guarantees the data is in the region you're doing the compute on it. Uh, it's inexpensive, highly available. Um, we also have near line and cold line as longer term storage options. So the neat part with all this is that it all runs in the same subsystem and the same API for access. You have the ability to get all of the data available to you on a per object basis within milliseconds. There's no difference in the SLA for access time between this. Um, you can see the pricing, this is all available on the web as well. Um, the, the, I guess the kind of relevant use bits are regional and multi-regional. You're just paying for what you use as you use it. Uh, Nearline has a 30 day and Coline has a 60, uh, sorry, 90 I should say. Um, the use case that we see is people aging the data off. So you sit it on regional and use it, and you can, if you choose, set an auto timer that will move it to, to the longer term tiers, uh, or you can do so yourself, as I mentioned, on a per object basis. Uh, with Nearline, that is, that's data we tend to put for kind of about a year. If you're gonna access it within a year, Nearline makes the best economic sense. If you're gonna leave it parked for more than a year, and it's kind of your LTO tape replacement as a long term storage option, we encourage people to put it on a cold line. And that gives you the option of being able to park the data there for a very long period of time. I had a question in my talk yesterday about bit rot. What do we do about that? We have some proprietary technology that goes through and ensures the data is fresh and ensures the integrity of it. So you can park your data on a cold line with the confidence that it's going to be there years from now when you go to read it. So using them all together, as I mentioned, the per object storage class is really cool. If you put 15 petabytes on and you're working with 300 terabytes that may be large and someone comes to you and it's a VFX show and you're working on a sequel because there are so many of those these days and you need to go back and get the geometry and texture files. You're going to re-rig the character, you're going to put a different muscle uh, setup on it and such, but you want the texture files, you want the, the, the Mari archive, um, you want to get the geometry that was used. You can go through and just pull those objects out um, and you can get access to them incredibly quickly. If it's something you're going to be rereading re multiple times, move it to regional. If you're just going to read it once and restore it locally, then just grab it on a cold line. So in terms of NFS file system options, uh, there's a couple different options. We have a roll your own single node filer, which we think is pretty great. Um, it's inexpensive in the fact that it's open source, so it's essentially free, but you're paying for the VM uh, and the storage that's attached to it and the network that it runs on. Um, but there's no additional cost beyond that. It is highly performant because of our network and the local SSD is Bcache and PDSSD backing it. So we find that we can typically serve line rate to a significant number of machines. You can also build out multiple single node filers. An example would be you have a kangaroo and a robot fight sequence and you want to put the kangaroo on one and the robot on the other. So you put the Alembic data on those two. You can put the textures across those. You can put a write 
um, node elsewhere, or you can split Alembic caches on one and textures on another. If you have six different characters in some superhero film, you can split them out across multiples. And that's a fairly common strategy. That's fine if you want to you know, manage your nodes and if that's how you're architected on-prem. There's also uh, Gluster, which is available as a managed and an open source solution. By managed, I should say supported. So a supported or a open source self-supported solution. Both of those are cloud file systems and the fact that you have to synchronize the data to get there. We'll talk about that in asset management in a couple of minutes. In terms of caching file systems though, we have a VR, uh, VFXT uh, and also PixCache. Um, the cool part with those is they're a cloud file system that are NFS posits compliant, but they also have a read through cache functionality. So you export your on-premises high performance file system to the cloud, and then as your render nodes read additional data, they hit the cloud file system first. If it's not there, they go back on-prem, grab it, and then pull it up, and then you're able to read it multiple times in the cloud. So this is a fantastic diagram uh, made by Adrian Graham, a uh, solutions architect in LA. Uh, he um, put this together and it explains pretty much how you'd architect for the cloud. Um, this is something he and I collaborated on uh, in terms of and we have a license server on-prem and a cloud-based license server. Um, there's um, a high-speed accelerated UDP uh, transfer. Um, we can talk a little bit about how to get things to the cloud. The, the neat thing about this, though, is if, if, you, if you remove the license server and leave everything else up pretty much as it is, you can go through and take the rendering VMs over in the corner and change those to GPUs put an oil and gas workload on this, and suddenly you have a high-performance compute scenario for that workload. You can either choose to go with local SSDs attached to the machines for simulation workloads, or you can have a large uh, NFS file system in the cloud, and your choice of read-through cache is just dependent on how your pipeline works. Well, I'll wait till everyone gets their photograph. Uh, and this will be available on YouTube shortly, so uh, excited about that. Um, but again, for me, the most exciting thing is the fact that any of the different high-performance compute workloads I mentioned earlier run with the same architecture. We have genomics and financial services all running on this similar architecture with really solid success. Now, once you're connected to us, getting the data into the cloud, that's the important part. So we offer GSUtil, which is a command line tool you have on your local machine that you can use to push data to and from the cloud. But simpler technologies, or I should say alternate technologies, such as rsync or parsync, with commercial offerings as well, with partners for Aspera and Signet, um, excuse me, those offer the capability of, of uh, providing significant threaded upload capabilities. I'm sure you know, everybody in this room is making pictures, um, and you guys are all, are all familiar with the technology. The important thing here, is that Google is open. If you want to run your open source, if you want to grab Tsunami and um, compile it and put it up and use that as your transport protocol, we're, we're, we're cool with that, or transfer mechanism, I should say. Uh, if you want a commercial managed service, that's fine too. In terms of asset management, getting the data to the cloud, that's, that's, it's, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good problem to have. Um, the, the easy model is, okay, we've done this stereo film, we, we finaled the left eye, now we want to take all the data, we know everything that we need, push it all up to the cloud, and then spin the VMs up and, and render the second eye. We've had a couple of customers do that. That's not a common workload. It's, it's really easy in the fact that, again, you know everything you need from a dependency standpoint in advance, you put it up, you make the pictures more realistically is a commercial workflow or a film workflow flow where you're updating assets on the fly. You've got your lighter making changes in Katana, they're pushing the button, textures may have, may, have, may have changed. You're in a scenario where there's always something that's changed before the render goes up. You need to make sure it's there. So these are a couple different, different strategies to be able to get the data up. The, the simplest thing we do from a pipeline standpoint is encourage people to just put a simple rsync in in their publishing step. So when they publish and commit, and version up within their pipeline and then let the, the next downstream user know or inform Shotgun or however you've chosen to architect it. A simple rsync will push that data up to the cloud. If you have a caching file system, you can have a, a micro node sitting on the backside that will read that data through the cache and it'll be warm at least uh, to be there. Um, one thing I should point out on this slide, um, we have one customer who uh, I think does a very clever thing. After the render's complete, they create an H.264 
uh, render of that. And they do that at a, at a fairly low resolution. They don't care about color accuracy. What they want is a really low bit rate, but I should clarify, a reduced bit rate, but sufficient quality to make sure the render worked properly. Did the textures fall off? Were the lights in the right place? Did, you know, does the render look the way it should? Then they bring down their 2 or 4K or however large it's going to be, giant EXR files with 50 AOVs and such. So that's a way to manage your egress costs to ensure that you're not just pulling 100% of the data that you've written. Um, that's one thing we discourage in the fact that if you pull every temp file, every log file, every simulation cache down, your egress costs will be higher than they need to be. You can leave all the data sitting in the cloud and just kind of peer in, grab the bits you want, and pull them back out. If you also leave the data in the cloud when you want to run compositing passes later, that's a really nice idea because you've already got it there. So as far as scheduling jobs, we work with a number of commercial queuing options, and bringing your own is uh, absolutely acceptable. So in terms of block storage for rendering, persistent disk, um, most customers are using PDSSD uh, in terms of backing their, sync, their, their filers with that. Um, as an example, the Avir will run on PDSSD, but it will also run on local SSD. And there's a significant performance enhancement when you do that. If you run the Avir on local SSD, you get roughly a 2x enhancement across the board in terms of sequential reads, writes, and random writes, but you get a four and a half time improvement on random reads. And for VFX workloads, it's pretty much a random read situation. So it's super fast with local SSD. In terms of virtual machines, so because we don't have an entirely containerized pipeline running on Kubernetes at this time, for the most part, we're using standard VMs for important workloads such as file systems, gateways, and such. And we're using parentable VMs for render nodes. Now, parental VMs are significantly discounted. They're 80% off. It's a, it's a penny a core. So a 32-core machine is 32 cents US per hour. Uh, so it's, you know, I made the joke, it's you know, three, four dollar. Um, in, in that context, you're in a scenario where you can run machines that are incredibly inexpensive. And at the same time, you can run a whole bunch of them. And you can turn them on and off for on a per frame basis. And we're going to talk a little, little more about that. You'll notice as well that it's the same subsystem you're running on. There's no difference. The VM's identical. It's just how, how we bill it and um, how we support it. We don't offer live migration um, on the parental machines. If we need to take some of them back, we will. It's excess capacity that, that we sell. So for workloads that are important and critical to the infrastructure, that would be gateways, a licensed server, file systems, we, uh, we encourage you to be able to keep those on a standard VM, and we will migrate those within our data center. If we have a service requirement for the rack that they're on, we'll move them somewhere else while they're running. I think it's really cool to see a single node filer running at full load and then have it migrate real time and switch over in, a, in an instantaneous period. Instantaneous, yeah, I know. Um, it's super fast, and it's, it's a really cool technology that only we have. The printable VMs, we encourage customers to run with checkpoints, snapshots, and such. So that way you can run an 8 or 12, a really long render, um, and be in a scenario where if the machine goes away, you can spin the machine up, and you get a 30-second warning on a printable VM that it's going away. So you can chase the log on that. You can use our cloud logging to, to inform your queuing system that that node is going away. When that happens, you can immediately spin up another machine. Um, we, you know, I haven't personally seen any situations where we stock out. We don't guarantee availability, obviously. However, I personally haven't seen a scenario where a customer has um, uh, completely stocked out his own in such a way that they can't fire up additional machines. So in that situation, that means there's a machine on that rack over there, and you can spin that one up. That machine comes up in about 35 seconds, so you can start loading the scene as that other one is still writing its checkpoint if you can get that last checkpoint off. So in terms of different models when you're looking at VFX rendering, um, the most common one we run into people who haven't done any rendering in the cloud yet is a rental model, where they're used to going to Bob and Sarah's rental service, and a truck rolls in, and a couple of racks come off, and they rack them up, and they plug them in, and they bin pack the jobs. That means they're buying 300 machines for four days or three weeks, and they wait a couple days to get the machines, and they have them for a period of time, and, and back they go. Um, another model beyond that is a co-location model. So you don't have enough space on-prem. Perhaps you're in London. Cooling is an issue. Real estate's challenging. Um, you want artists there as opposed to machines in the closet. So you rent a colo space somewhere else, run some fiber to it. That's great. However, the scale is fixed in that scenario. You've just sort of moved the, 
moved the problem somewhere else in that regard. Um, the dynamic model is the one that I'm personally most excited about, and the fact that you take advantage of our per minute billing capability, and you can scale kind of as much as you need to. Um, if you come to us and say, you know, we need 50,000 cores, we don't have just unlimited cores sitting around all the time, but if you let us know you know, what it is you need, we'll give you a quota that we can give you access to at any given time. But if you need something really massive, you're rendering a ride film and it's a high frame rate or it's crazy large and it's stereo. And, you know, so now you're dealing with like 6K images and there's two of them and you're doing 60 FPS and such. If you need to render that a final production quality, you know in the schedule from production when that's going to occur. You let us know in advance and we can get you 120,000 cores or really or more. It's, it really just comes down to working with us from a scheduling standpoint because Google Cloud Platform running on the same infrastructure as the rest of Google is in a scenario where we can work with the scheduling capacity teams internally and turn up and make available a large block of machines for you across a couple zones, but at the same time, that's a huge amount of scale. So in terms of workloads, uh, kind of excited about the fact that beyond rendering, and this is a rendering-centric talk, the same infrastructure that you put in place architecturally to be able to run and make pictures on the cloud enable you to also do high-performance geometry caching for really heavy scenes in Houdini, for instance, or in you know, Biofrost with Maya, um, simulation, flip, fluid solvers, destruction, finite element, deep compositing and nuke, um, all of that's available to you. And we're also able to handle everything from camera ingest, from camera raw, debayering, editorial, all the way through to archive after you've done final content delivery. So one of the workloads that I spent a bunch of time doing in production was simulation. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some fluid simulation and point out some of the differences between rendering and how to get around some of the common perceptions of how do we do fluid sim in the cloud? That seems really complicated. There's a silly amount of compute and RAM required in order to be able to do simulations. The files they write are massive. 20 to 40 gigs per frame is what I was writing. Um, when I was on-prem um, at, uh, at Animal Logic at one point uh, for Sucker Punch, I found that almost a third of my simulation time was write speeds across the network. And we had a great network there and a new high-speed filer, but just they were large files. They took time to write. And the solver that I was using at initially wouldn't initiate the second frame. So, you know, we had to make some tweaks and changes, but the opportunity to be able to write to local SSD is nearly instantaneous. It's super fast with the high-speed storage. So the wedging term is something that a simulation artist ha has, to, has to do. It, it's, a, it's an old film term moved forward into digital land. But the idea would be that you want to make a fluid simulation in this, in this, this case, but you have to figure out what, what the value is. Everybody who's run simulations in this room knows that it's a nonlinear situation in terms of the solver. The solver, you can't just say, oh, I want to make the, I want to make the force double, so I'm just going to double the force. It doesn't always work that way. You need you know, time on the box in terms of number of hours of working with the simulator. So if I would start a shot on a Monday morning, it might be Wednesday before I have run enough simulation passes to figure out what is the vorticity going to look like, what does the impulse force look like. This is a simple um, resolution change, and you can see the number of voxel delta as well as the change in the look of the simulation. Um, you can notice that the curling is completely different. It's not just a higher resolution version of it. The solver actually looks a little bit different. So it's essential for the simulation artist to be able to have an opportunity to wedge quickly and be able to get responses back. Um, Adrian Graham uh, gave this, uh, this a go, and um, this is some code that uh, he put together, both a Mel and a Python version of it for wedging, um, and he used Maya Bifrost. Uh, I've also built this in Houdini. Um, it's extensible in your own solver as well. The, um, this, is, this is how you actually run the individual simulations. Um, the code samples will be um, um, visible on YouTube, so you'll, you'll, you'll be able to reproduce chunks of this if you wish. So in terms of actually being able to deploy the wedges, this opportunity is really cool. Um, I like the idea of a simulation artist being able to say, I want to run this workload, and I want to spin up eight 64 core machines with 250 gigs of RAM. You can go with custom shapes, so if, you want, if your solver flattens out at 48 cores, no problem. 28 cores, whatever the optimum number is in, ter in terms of RAM and CPU, you only pay for what you use on a permanent basis. So in this context, you're going to do the base simulation, and then you're going to have to mesh that so you have a renderable object. And then on top of that, you're going to do additional passes based on that surface object you've made. And then you end up with the test render. The key, though, is in this scenario is to keep all the data on the cloud. You write the really expensive base simulation out 
leave it there. You, the high resolution mesh you generate, you can leave it there as well. And when you do the, the render, you don't care about color accuracy for a simulation, you're just looking for motion. So you're gonna have a shot camera, and if you wish, a witness camera. So you can have those two JPEGs generated, you can pull those down, display them on a simple HTML page if you want, and you can see all eight simulations running, and you can choose which ones you want to kill. So in terms of the architecture, how do you make that work? Um, this is uh, a nice little description of just saying, we have some sim VMs in the cloud, a license server to make them work. You can point back on-prem, and then you have some local disk. It's really easy. You put the files in the cloud on local SSD, you run the simulations. When you're done, you shut it off. And as the eight machines are running in this example, you can turn off three or four of them right away, and you can turn off additional ones. But you can let like one, three, and seven. You think those are going to be a good, a good one. Um, you let those continue to run over lunch and come back and check them, and then you have some idea what kind of numbers are going to work for you to get that look. If you want to do a full workstation build out, um, this is what that architecture looks like. And the, the, the cool part with this is you'll notice that um, we have both local workstations and SIM VMs working here. So you can be in a scenario where you're running both hybrid and in the cloud for this. Something with our GPU offering is we offer both compute GPUs. So if you wanted to use a renderer like Octane, for instance, and you wanted to be able to render on GPU or you wrote your own custom GPU fire solver, for instance, we have a significant number of compute GPUs um, that are uh, available and becoming available in all of our data centers around the world. We also have display GPUs becoming available in the next little bit. And the cool part with that is you can use something like Teradici for a PC over IP solution. You can have a remote desktop session. And there are a number of um, well-known software providers that we're working with who are um, uh, in a position of being able to offer their software through this service. So the Zero client is really nice. You get this tiny little box. It'll run multiple 2K monitors. The nice thing is if you need to hire 30 artists, you can go out and get 30 artists, and you can give them monitors, mice, keyboards, Wacom tablets, and a thin client. Done. And they're now able to work in the cloud. In a shorter term scenario, you can have artists who can't get that shot finished. They're in, a, they're in a difficult place. Their rig is too heavy. The muscle sim is just taking too long. They, you can give them a machine that has twice as much RAM or double the cores or some combination of that. And that's really compelling to be able to get difficult shots through the pipeline. So a sim factory in the cloud, um, we have a whole bunch of compute and storage, and now we have display and compute GPUs. So we're really trying to round out the complete offering of what's required to be able to have a completely virtualized pipeline in the cloud. The last thing that I'm going to talk about here is the idea of a production safety valve. And that, it's important, I think, to be able to engage with us a little earlier. I do get calls from people and emails saying, hey, we're delivering this thing on Tuesday. You know, it's Thursday at 2 in the morning. And um, there, there's some problems, and they need to be able to get something out. We can help in that scenario, it's true, um, but it's quite a bit easier if you engage in a proof of concept a little earlier, and then we're in a scenario where you're set up and able to run on the cloud. You don't have to use it, you just have the capability, and that way if production comes to you and says, hey, the director changed their mind, and that happens, and we need to be able to deliver this, or another facility schedule doesn't work out, we can take on an extra two sequences, but we don't have the render power for it, you could say, no problem, we can render this on Google, and we're already set up to do so. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, bring Hannes up on stage. Thank you, sir. There we go. For you. Brilliant, thank you. Right, I'll just leave my water here. Cool. Well, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm really super excited to be here. What I'm going to do over the next kind of 30 minutes is to take you on a bit of a journey for how Google Cloud helped MPC kind of bring the Jungle Book to life, um, showing some of the key challenges that we face, give you an overview of the technical design that we implemented, um, and then also give you kind of an outlook where we kind of see the cloud going for us in the future. Uh, first, a little bit about MPC. So we um, craft visual experiences for both uh, feature film uh, VFX and advertising, also including virtual reality um, and digital installations. We've been around for over kind of 25 years. Um, this is some of the uh, yeah, past movies that, that we've been working on. Um, here's an overview of all the projects that we did uh, in 2016. Or well, actually, not all of them. Uh, we completed a total of 15 projects. Um, on the advertising side, uh, so on the film side, on, on the advertising side, it was uh, 2019, which is a great number if you have to put it on the same slide with 2016 to remember. Um, 
Right. Um, so although we delivered uh, 15 pr uh, movies in 2016, um, we tend to work on roughly 20 projects at any given point in time. Um, so these ones are about to deliver this year, um, but a lot of these were already in the making uh, in 2016 and going to be close to a screen to you at some point this year. Uh, MPC is roughly 2,500 people worldwide, uh, the majority being split between Vancouver, Montreal, London, and Bangalore. Um, all of our productions are run across at least two of those sites. That's predominantly due to make uh, leverage specialisms that are only available in some of our sites. So really close collaboration um, and data transfers between all of these sites is hugely important for us to deliver our productions. So talking about our productions, what in order for us to create these visual effects, we constantly need to kind of plan how many people, how much compute, and how much storage we require. To do that, we look at each of these shots that you can kind of see, and we kind of break them down per days um, that we think we're going to require in each of the departments that are required to make these mo um, shots. Uh, so this gives us the kind of like total amount of man days um, that we will need for the project, and from that we derive schedules, which we then use to order to see kind of like that's the people, that's the storage and create we require. Um, I'd kind of like to take you through that process in a bit of detail because it's actually quite important for how we plan, and then you can kind of see really how the cloud allows us to change that. Um, Due to the nature of the movies that we work on, uh, we tend to see these kind of like massive peaks throughout the year and predominantly a kind of uh, late spring and late autumn, which is due to the like, summer and winter blockbuster releases that we're working on. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we do roughly 20 projects. What I'm going to do just for simplicity's sakes is use an example of kind of three somewhat fictitious pro um, projects, but the kind of scale that I mentioned kind of literally applies to all of them that we, that we work on. Uh, so here is kind of the, the result of us breaking down all of the, the work that's going to be required and then kind of figuring out how many people we need. And this is really the starting point. From this, we then go and have our internal models that we then use to predict the amount of compute and the amount of storage that we require. Um, what is kind of interesting that depending on the project, uh, so depending if it's a character heavy show, if it's an effects heavy show, environment heavy shows, these profiles kind of change quite a lot. Uh, so you can see this kind of on the storage side. The big challenge is that all of these things peak at the same time throughout uh, yeah, the production cycle, literally. So just imagine like 15 more of these kind of like stacking up. And give you idea of scale, when we talk people, that's roughly a couple of hundreds per project. On the compute side, we're talking millions of hours to compute. And on the storage side, our projects tend to be in around the better byte when they kind of reach that, that peak capacity. Uh, so that means uh, not only do we need to manage, plan, and provision for these peaks, uh, we also need to build all of our infrastructure to constantly kind of be able to scale up and down uh, for us to deliver our productions uh, without any impact. The other thing is when we look at the trends, now this is kind of like a 12-month schedule right here, we see these shrinking quite significantly. Um, the thing that isn't shrinking is the complexity of the shot work that's required. Right? So these peaks are just going to go and increase and increase and increase. Um, just an idea of scale. So for the Jungle Book, we had 800 people working on it. Uh, in total, it was 35 million uh, war clock hours uh, to compute the movie. And at peak, uh, the Jungle Book required uh, two petabytes of storage. So let me give you a bit of kind of background uh, details about the scale and kind of complexity that we faced on the Jungle Book. In 2016, uh, Disney awarded us with the majority on the work on the Jungle Book. Um, we were tasked with uh, creating 1,200 shots. Uh, it was over hundreds of characters that we needed to build, 60 environments, over 2,000 environment assets. That resulted in roughly 12 square miles um, of jungle, which, according to Google, is a quarter of the size of San Francisco. So you can kind of get the perspective of how much we actually had to build. Uh, this watering shot that you can see right here had a total of kind of like 200 characters within it. And it was also the first show to move up to completely new software stack. Now, our software stack uses a large amount of kind of third party software, but then a huge amount of kind of like custom tooling that we have to build. And this was really important because we needed to hit the creative and artistic vision that John Favreau had set out, um, which was the director on this movie. Uh, it's had been an absolutely amazing experience for us, uh, really satisfying uh, due to just the, the recognition we've received through the industry. Uh, because, yeah, it was a couple of weeks ago, I think, the, yeah, we finally won the Oscar for the movie. So it's, it's been amazing. But rather than talking, I think uh, lights and the audio, please, because so here this is a breakdown of some of the uh, effects work uh, that was 
required for the movie. So as you can see, quite a lot of fluid simulation as Jeff was. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, right. Uh, so as I just mentioned before the clip, there was uh, quite a lot of new technologies that, uh, that was required for us to deliver the movie. Um, one of those particular pieces um, of third-party technology was a new version of Render Man, which has really moved away from its uh, more traditional rails-based pipeline to a completely native path tracer. Um, we have a really great relationship with Pixar, um, and some of the initial tests that we did with these new versions gave us the absolute great confidence that the photorealistic kind of visuals um, that were required to deliver would, have, would be possible uh, with this new version. Um, the thing is, we, we fine-tune kind of like all of our compute tasks specifically for the task. So we look at what's the optimum in terms of CPU versus um, RAM versus storage um, per task. Uh, in addition, we kind of had to revamp our internal rendering software stack um, to make use of this new version. So it's actually quite a significant risk to kind of through for a production say, well, we're going to change our renderer. Um, to give you an idea of that scale, when I mentioned that the Jungle Book took 35 million render hours to, to finish, um, so that includes everything like simulations and all that, 80% of that is random and related hours. So it was kind of a, a significant risk for us to do it. Um, but I'm really glad what we did. Uh, the other thing is um, there was a huge amount of internal development that we needed to do. Um, ranging for how do we model the uh, environments, how do we simulate all the jungle, um, how do we improve our character animation, but uh, and also various workflow improvements. So one of the, the ones that I want to um, pick on is uh, we really needed to move um, up our quality for our QC and kind of, um, yeah, just approval renders, um, which traditionally would be more of these kind of like puppets cut up um, and tend to use kind of like OpenGL GPU-based uh, visuals. So um, what we did is we actually said, no, we're going to use RenderMan for that as well, which meant that we were going to go from something like this to something like this as part of the QC step. It was really important for our animation department to see the impact of fur for all of the kind of like really subtleties um, in relation to the performance. So this was really important for us to get right for this movie. Now, what that meant is that due to the volume of Jungle Book, due to all of this new technology, we needed, like our plans when I showed you those graphs for compute, just like they reached new heights. Um, so in essence, we needed to do and get more compute. Now, our existing approach, like Jeff mentioned, we would go out and we would go and purchase and we could look at our data center and get all of that stuff in there and ready and then use it. Um, or we would go out and lease it. But that for the time frame that we needed was going to be very cost ineffective. Um, 
and also kind of challenging to get in time uh, for when it was needed. Now, we had already ha uh, had m multiple conversations with Google to see how can we use the cloud to actually give us a third option. And this time, like all parties said, this is we're going to go do and do it. So what did we set out? We wanted to add uh, 10,000 cores uh, for a duration of two months. Um, however, and this is really important, it was crucial to provide this additional compute um, with an official approval from our client. So that meant we needed to meet theirs and our internal security standards for cloud-based compute. Um, all of our sites are regularly audited, literally at multiple times throughout the year, on our internal architecture and our technical implementation to ensure that they're aligned with the security practices that are part of the industry. To do that, um, MPC and Technicolor, so Technicolor is MPC's parent company, uh, we partnered with ISE, they're the independent security evaluators, to provide um, a security assessment um, of our kind of remote compute platform and then before submitting that proposal to Disney for approval. Uh, this was an ongoing process throughout the whole project because any alterations, any new appliances that we wanted to introduce uh, needed to be re-evaluated and then resubmitted to approval. So here's the kind of technical design that we ended up with. Um, MPC's existing infrastructure is built around centralized NFS filers for both software and uh, production content. Um, I mean, both of these receive multiple updates per day uh, in terms of on the software side, new tools, new configurations. So they're in constant kind of influx and yeah, being worked on. Um, all of MPC sites are connected via Technicolor's production uh, WAN, um, but all of these kind of like film production zones, which is one of the big kind of security requirements, do not have any external connectivity, so no access to the internet, uh, internet from them. Um, there are some shared uh, services zones that you've got here, which is that do have external connectivity, but these are tightly controlled with application and kind of like network XCLs. So the initial design that we kind of put forward is to use um, VPN tunnels and to provide burst capacity uh, into Google's cloud using VPN tunnels. Um, and to uh, the, the, the big thing was is there was going to be no production content in the cloud, uh, only for like temporary logs and some scratch base that was required for some of our applications. To provide these VPN endpoints, um, MPC worked with SohoNet. So they have a product called Fastlane. Um, which enabled us to get the kind of VPN connectivity that we required given the network throughput requirements that we had. Um, so since this initial setup, uh, we've actually started to use the Google uh, managed VPN on the uh, GCP side, but we're still uh, on the Fastline product um, on the Technicolor side. Um, with this initial design, we knew from the beginning that we had to deal with latencies because we weren't going to re-architect any of our kind of internals. Um, so we chose uh, Europe West um, to just reduce the amount of latency that we had uh, from our London side. However, the kind of 9 milliseconds um, that we kind of measured uh, was too much for some of our tools um, that really were used to like really quick um, access to our applications filers. So those various different interesting um, timeouts were encountered. Um, in addition, like when we increased to more and more calls, they just became more and more apparent. So to deal with this, um, it was kind of on one of the slides from Jeff. Um, what we initially did is we, we put out um, our application file into the cloud. Um, our preference would have been to just use the Avia uh, virtual appliance that existed. Unfortunately, uh, this didn't quite work out of the box. Um, because of our security restrictions, what the Avia needs to do is to actually speak to the Google APIs, which wasn't possible in the setup that we had. Um, now, we already use Avia internally. We forefront all of our application and, and content filers with the Avia, um, so we have a great connection with them. They came in and they actually helped build us a custom virtual appliance um, that was then able to, to perform within our system architecture. Now, along with the Avia, we also had kind of internal tooling that needed to require to talk to the Google API because, hey, we need to provision machines, right? <coughs> we want new PBMs, we want new standard instances. So we needed to figure out a way for how do we make this kind of communication happen. Um, and the proposal that we put forward uh, was to use kind of like a tiered proxy, which kind of enabled bootstrapping and any of the kind of API requirements to yeah, get GCP resources and for the Avia. <coughs> now, all of this was, of course, uh, resubmitted to ISE and then also to Disney for approval. 
So the kind, this is kind of the final design uh, that we put in place. So on the uh, GCP side, we had uh, render nodes. So these were dedicated to run the render tasks. They were a mixture of PVM and standard instances running an MPC custom CentOS 6 image. Uh, we had file servers, again, purely for kind of logs and any temporary scratch that was required by some of our application. Also running a custom MPC CentOS 6 image. Then the VPN endpoints, they were work done by um, SohoNet. Uh, to provide us the network performance through our VPN setups, and then the Avia virtual appliance, which was the custom MPC Avia build um, to really help on optimizing the performance that we required. And really, most importantly, that no content was ever stored at rest in the cloud. You can assume that behind the scenes, we had host and key management all in place, and there was strong role-based um, authorization to ensure strict access for any kind of admin and support uh, throughout this platform. Now. Just, just uh, I like my graphs. So here is to, to show you kind of the importance of the Avia. Um, so this was um, a graph of one of the render nodes um, without the Avia. And if you kind of pay attention to the left-hand side, if I change the scale. So once the Avia was put in place, we moved from literally 50 uh, reads per second up to 2,000 reads per second. Now this is really important because when, when you look at the performance of a renderer, they read, they like to read a lot of data. That's due to the amount of texture, to the amount of geometry, and just various different data types. So this was really important for us to be put in place. The other thing that was important was, or, or literally, as a consequence, we obviously had a huge amount of kind of like network traffic drop um, with the red line kind of marking when we had the AV in place. So at this point in time, we're really happy, right? We solved the security. We, we got all of the throughput that we needed to do, so it was now a question of like, how much can we fire up the cloud? And this is where I'm just going to hand over to the video again to just show you the choice of what we could put up on the cloud. And there's audio again.
All right. All right, thank you again. Um, now, unfortunately, um, our production budgets are not quite as infinite as the resources that you can get into the cloud. So what we had to do is cut a bit of work of how do we identify what kind of jobs makes the most sense to send to the cloud whilst keeping within our production um, constraints. Um, first off, we kind of went into what, what's the ideal criteria to send tasks to, to the cloud. Um, for us, that was tasks with limited I.O. to just ensure we were not going to, because remember, the production content was always uh, on our end. Um, so any kind of download and any writes would cause us, uh, cost us egress charges and generally to be quite compute heavy. So we just make sure um, we make use of the great uh, instances that we had out there. Um, they should be tolerant to preemption so that we can make use of the uh, uh, lower cost PBMs wherever possible. Um, in general, that meant that our lighting rendering tasks uh, just fitted that profile a lot better than comp end effects, which tend to be extremely high I.O. Um, and also very intolerant for preemption if you just kill a simulation halfway through. So our random tasks were the ones um, that we targeted first. Uh, the improvements to our QC process uh, to move to render man in comparison to kind of the OpenGL renders, um, plus the volume of shots that we had meant that we had had thousands of tasks on our internal backlog. So luckily, from the QC kind of perspective, um, you don't necessarily need a full sequence of frames to ensure that things like lighting directions, I mean, I can look at this image and say, yep, the lighting direction is OK. I don't need to see everything else that, that we can just move that along um, and then do a final render. Um, and also kind of from animation perspective, um, you were OK to just see the, the um, performance, even if it kind of frames were missing. It was more important to just have a reference point to ensure, yes, from a QC perspective, we're actually able to move these things along. Um, so these kind of QC renders was a perfect target to be sent to the PBMs. Um, now, our production moves through a large number of departments that are kind of shown here. Um, all of our work is kind of split into two main areas. We have what we call the build areas, where we construct all of our kind of characters and environments. Um, and then we reuse those on all the various different shots. For the Jungle Book, I mean, every single department was important, but the kind of Two key ones was animation from just the performance perspective that we had to deliver, and lighting to ensure that we can deliver the photorealistic visuals that were required um, to meet the division of the director. Now, our ability to add additional resources for the animation QC and then from a lighting QC and final render um, standpoint enabled to production to be really com uh, confident that we're going to hit the demands of the shows. So on a daily basis, kind of what happened was that uh, we looked at our daily backlog in terms of volume and priorities. If required, uh, a budget was set and also priorities were um, required, uh, provided um, to then ensure we knew kind of like what we wanted to get through in the night. So we used Tractor, uh, one of the schedulers that was mentioned by Jeff, um, for our internal management of our hosts and the submission and processing of the tasks. So that's kind of like two main areas that we needed to develop um, our own tools for. One was for the automatic provisioning. So this was to say, given the budget, how many PVMs and how many kind of like standard instances do we need to, uh, do we require? Um, and then on the other side was kind of like, how do we ensure that we can get kind of the right tasks sent over um, to, to the cloud? What was important here is, um, in order to make best use of the Avia, we kind of needed to ensure that we can only send kind of certain, like the same kind of scenes or shots to the farm. So make sure that, hey, let's just make sure the waterhole shots all go to the cloud, or let's make sure that we'd only the, the jungle sequence here on the bottom goes. So that way, the, crash, uh, the cache wouldn't constantly kind of like trash itself. And that worked really well. And then also to say that Tractor and itself really handled the load quite well of all of these new additional machines that we're going to add um, on a nightly basis. So we didn't need to do any work to just handle the increased load that was on Tractor itself. Right, so just leaves me to conclude. Um, first off, here's some statistics of how much we, we use the cloud uh, in at kind of peak, we added an excess of 14,000 cores per night. Um, overall, that computed uh, 30. Th 360,000 hours, that's roughly 41 years. Um, 1.5 million tasks were completed. Um, internally, we, we think this was a really great success um, across our technology operations and production teams because everybody came together, right? You needed to control uh, the amount of money that we're going to spend, and we needed to know that we actually can get the throughput and have all of the tech ready. Um, the agility and just general availability of the cloud resources enabled literally millions of tasks to be completed in a very short time. 
so if we look at kind of what, what, what I call out the key benefits. So it, yeah, the quickly added capacity, this was really important. When the production of that scale is in demand, you want to ensure that they feel as confident as they can that, yes, we're going to be able to deliver the movie. This was really important for us. Um, the agility, just in terms of being able to say, hey, you know, today I want 70% PVMs and only 30% standard instances, was really important so we can guide it on a, on a daily basis. The other thing that we found, uh, which was really cool, was that, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, we, we kind of find tune our processes to say, all right, what's the split of CP versus RAM on these particular machines? Um, on the cloud, actually getting a new machine profile is really easy, right? You just say, hey, I want this kind of configuration and be done. If I would have to do that internally, it's actually quite a lot of effort to make sure that we can re portioned parts of our farm. So this actually helped us to do a lot of playground testing. Um, the other part is uh, we now have established security processes and documentation, everything that we can now go and engage with a lot of our other clients to also ensure that we can use the cloud for their projects. Then controlled cost and photos. Again, our budgets are qu quite constrained, so knowing of what we can compute, what we're able to deliver, and the associated cost with this is really important. Um, and then finally, uh, we've now really established some really close partnerships across the various different third party, well, the cloud, uh, Jeff and all these guys, uh, which really helps us kind of look into the future. So let's look into the future. Um, we. We strongly believe in the future of um, the cloud for visual effects. Um, so we're now working on a project to literally take our whole platform cloud native to enable us to process our visual effects. Now, our core platform tooling that we already have is built around concepts or cloud-like concepts. So we have a strong microservices framework. We have a well-established data asset management platform. And our software and kind of build and configuration system is all built around containers. So we have all of these things. What's nice with the cloud, I'm now able to actually run that in an environment which is kind of separated from our existing infrastructure so I can iterate a lot quicker, which then helps me to build out that new platform and then being able to change my internal stack a lot easier. Also, if this stuff is of interest to us, we are looking, we are hiring, so do have a look at that link and or grab me afterwards. Now, here's kind of the outlook where we see us kind of moving in terms of the cloud. Rather than going through every single one of those departments one by one, what we actually want to do is just take the whole lot and move it to the cloud. And then being able to literally just pull down the QC and kind of like final renders to look at locally. Now, that would mean we could use the cloud to also manage our storage constraints and more importantly, deal with the kind of like inter-site connectivity because the global nature of our productions just is what we do. So this. This lets me to thank uh, Disney for just allowing me to show you not only the amazing visuals, but also the, like, the technical artistry that was required to bring the Jungle Book to life. Uh, my colleagues at Technicolor, uh, my team at MPC, I mean, it's been an ongoing dedication and passion to just embrace this new technology. Uh, SohoNet and Avia for really being behind us for their availability and their ongoing support. And for the GCP team, I mean, yeah, Thomas, Salomon, Bjorn, Jeff, these guys are amazing. And just this ongoing collaboration, yeah, we're looking forward to see what the future brings. So with this, just want to thank you all for listening. And I guess...